Hi everyone, I'm Ale Davis and welcome to Mediate Academy's roundup of mediation news from around the world. As always, we try and be informative, illuminating and a little outrageous from time to time. Welcome to this week in mediation. It's our 10th show and I'm delighted to welcome my co-presenter, Professor Nadia Alexander. Nadia, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Pleasure to be here as usual, especially for the 10th show. And uh, not only is it the 10th show, but it's also another special event. Uh, tell us about that, Nadia. Well, it is the year of the rooster. And last weekend was Chinese New Year. So, Alan, welcome to the year of the rooster. Ah, I see. Many I have lots of prosperity and health and success. I notice your very stylish red jacket. Oh, very observant of you. Yes, red is the lucky colour, symbolising good fortune and joy. And also it's the uh, colour of the Welsh Rugby Union uh, rugby <laughs> jersey. And we had a victory on the weekend, which I'm also uh, delighted about. Um, and it's going to be a joyous week for mediation. And so tell us what's coming up in the show today, please. Well, this week, uh, in honour of Chinese New Year, we're going to commence with some developments in Asia and have a look at Singapore's new Mediation Act. Uh, then we're going to uh, look at the trend in mediation uh, competitions from India to Paris and Vienna. Uh, and uh, then we're going to jump uh, from uh, Europe across the pond, as you like to say, Alad, to the United States and have a look at a recent decision on confidentiality. And uh, finally... Uh, we're going to have a bit of a think about uh, truth. Truth. The truth. And Trump. Truth and Trump. Trump and truth. Well, that sounds like an exciting show. Uh, <laughs> Trump, then, Trump the truth. Trump the truth. <laughs> Well, as it's, look, as it's Chinese New Year time, why don't we start with uh, what's happening uh, over in Asia? Well, Singapore has passed a long-anticipated Mediation Act. Uh, it's certainly not the first piece of legislation uh, on mediation in Singapore. There's uh, been legislation on court-related mediation and also on community mediation for, uh, for a number of years. So, so what's the difference then if it's been around for court-related and community? Well, in the past couple of years, Singapore has been very busy revising and refining and extending its dispute resolution uh, offerings, particularly in the cross-border uh, arena. And so Singapore now offers international parties a full suite of dispute resolution services from mediation through to arbitration and, and uh, various hybrids as well. And so the law is basically offering legislative support for, in particular, international commercial parties. So it applies to all types of mediation, apart from uh, where, where um, an area of mediation has already been legislated, such as community or, or court-related mediation. Um, and, it, and it does apply beyond international commercial. Um, but clearly that was one of the, um, the, uh, the impetuses for, for the law, if you like. And it basically strengthens the framework for um, the enforcement of mediated settlement agreements, including cross-border mediated settlement agreements, and of course we've talked about that in previous shows, and that's a very, um, you know, a very hot topic at the moment. And the law also codifies a number of issues to cl that clarify the common law. For example, issues around uh, confidentiality and admissibility or not admissibility of mediation uh, evidence. It deals with um, staying court proceedings to preserve legal rights while people are off mediating and also expressly allows uh, foreign mediators to participate in mediations similar to what is the practice in arbitration. So, you know, basically there's nothing uh, particularly sort of dramatically new. It's, it's a clarification and codification uh, uh, process or project, if you like. But in, what is new is the... Uh, is the other provisions related to the enforcement of mediated settlement agreements. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I might just say a couple of words about that. The um, Singapore Mediation Act has got some similarities with the Hong Kong Mediation Ordinance, um, especially in relation to the provisions on confidentiality and non-admissibility of mediation evidence. And, and this is a good thing. I think it's a really good example of the harmonization of mediation rules around the, uh, around the world. And I think harmonization is good 
um, as long as it doesn't involve dumbing down. And I know the Hong Kong provisions, uh, well, at least to my mind, are very, uh, very sophisticated provisions um, on confidentiality. And so to to uh, to enact provisions similar to this, I think, is a very good thing and a step forward for mediation, not just in Singapore but also um, but also globally. Um, in relation to the uh, mediated settlement agreements, what the Act actually does, it says if parties agree, they can apply to the court for the court to record a written and signed mediated settlement agreement as an order of that court. Right. So effectively, your mediated settlement agreement, whether it be a domestic one or an international one, becomes an order of the court. Um, but this can only happen provided two additional requirements are met besides the agreement of the parties to do so. One is that the mediation must have been administered by a designated mediation service provider and the mediation must have been conducted by a certified mediator. And these last two provisions, I think, are there really to, to ensure the high quality of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of mediation processes and of, of uh, mediator performance, particularly when you're going to offer some sort of expedited um, enforcement mechanism to accompany the mediated settlement agreement. You know, you really need to, to make sure your quality processes are very tight in that case. Okay, so if you want your mediated settlement agreement to be a court order, you just can't use anyone. I mean, what about foreign mediators? Right. Well, it's a really good question, um, particularly in relation to international commercial mediation, because very often people will want to have foreign lawyers and foreign uh, mediators or non-Singaporean mediators involved. So it's important here to remember that the legislation doesn't exist on its own, right? It's been brought in to complement um, an institutional framework that's been set up in Singapore um, uh, offering mediation services. So, for example, the Singapore International Mediation Centre was set up at the end of 2014 specifically to offer international mediation, particularly international commercial mediation. It, it has a panel of mediators um, from around the world, and these are certified by SIMI, which is the Singapore International Mediation Institute. Um, which has a link to the International Mediation Institute, IMI as we know it, um, and uh, which also certifies uh, mediators around the world. So, uh, you know, so you can definitely use a foreign mediator, um, but your mediator does need to be certified. So you don't need to be uh, Singaporean to be certified as a mediator under the Act? Absolutely not, right? Um, because, you know, because the idea is really to to offer an international uh, mediation service, in particular an international commercial mediation service with a pool of high caliber international mediators. Um, and, you know, that, that quality standard is assured by making sure that they are, that they are certified. I oh, see. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, um, we're in <laughs> Asia, so let's stay in Asia. Uh, or, and we're moving on to the topic of uh, mediation competitions. Now, I think there was a, a quite a successful mediation competition in India, in Goa, last month, Nadia. Did you go to Goa by no. any chance, Alan? Uh, unfortunately not. I would have loved to have gone to Goa. And um, I could just, I've seen a few photographs uh, of uh, some of the uh, judges uh, busy lounging on their beach huts, uh, g gazing out into the sunset, um, clearly working very oh. hard. But mm. I'm, I'm really interested in this, what seems to be a real trend in mm. mediation competitions. One, I'm interested because uh, I, you know, I've spoken to some notable academics in uh, mediation who feel that it's a bit of an oxymoron. You know, you've got a, a mediation competition. I mean, how does that work? So we've got the one in Goa, we've got the ICC now, which is happening uh, as, we, as speak, we speak As we speak in mm. Paris. Um, there was the CDRCs in Vienna, which is also uh, happening again this year. Um, I mean, what, what's, what's all this trend in, in mediation competitions about, Nadia? Well, you know, I think it's really exciting and I think, it, it, you know, it is important. And, you know, it's interesting that, that you know, that people, uh, you know, talk about the, you know, the tension or the oxymoron or about having a, a mediation competition because mediation is supposed to be about a, a collaboration. And I think I have two responses to that. Um, one is mediation occurs uh, often in the shadow of the court. 
there's a tension anyway. We have to deal with this tension. You know, people are trying to collaborate within a legal framework um, that, that tells them that if this doesn't work out, you're going to have to go off to court and compete anyway, right? So we're often dealing with this tension. But I think the second and, and, and arguably more important point is that it's not just uh, uh, the mediation process. Well, the mediation process isn't the subject of the competition. And in some of the competitions, it's also not the mediators, but it's rather the mediation advocates, okay. right? So, okay. it's, so it's the, the students who are playing the role of lawyers representing their clients in mediation um, that, are, that are being judged. Yeah. Um, that's the case. Yeah. Um, I think in most of the competitions and some of the competitions then also judge um, judge the actual mediators. Yeah. Um, you know, I, yeah, and yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a it's it's tough to do to demonstrate how well you collaborate um, uh, while still maintaining your client's interests and doing so in a uh, potentially ultimately competitive environment. But that's the job. It's I, tough. Well, I mean, what I like, I've, I've only attended one, and that was the one in Vienna last year. And what I liked about that particular uh, competition was the way the young people, uh, including myself, but you know, I'm obviously. <laughs> over, over I'm just and, going to ask about that. <laughs> but the way they engaged in it, and they got so excited and passionate, and they brought brought a, it, it almost injected the world of mediation with some. Um, vibrancy and enthusiasm that I haven't seen for for, for a long time uh, and also I think there's, there's, there's going to be some kind of element of uh, reprogramming, reconditioning people's natural dispositions to uh, dealing with conflict and disputes so that they do approach it from a non-adversarial curious let's you know let's have a dialogue first rather than, and we've talked about this phenomenon, rather than, okay, let's establish our positions and see you know, whose rights should prevail. So, I, you know, I think it's, it's definitely uh, going to help, hopefully, shift the, the culture of dispute resolution so that it does become a dialogue first. But I just really enjoyed the way young people just really got into the, um, into the spirit of the competition. So onward and upward. With more mediation competitions, I think so. I think so. I, you know, I think it's good to know that the future of mediation is in good hands, Nadia. Yes, but we need to remain vigilant so that we've got a, you know, a growing and sustainable profession to hand over to the next generation. So we can't just sit on our laurels. And I don't think that's just all about training mediators. I think it's important that we have good, robust laws. I mean, we talked earlier about legislation in the show, um, but what about case law, Nadia? Well, we like to keep up to date on that. So here's a decision from the U.S. Second Court of Appeals, um, and it's called In Retelligent in, uh, Incorporated, and, uh, and as usual, you'll find a link to this case um, uh, uh, on the uh, on the website. So the facts are a little bit complicated, but I mean, the most important things to remember are this, that it's about a CEO who's called Mandel, and he is fired because he owes the company $12 million um, that he hasn't paid back. Mm -hmm. hmm. So uh, so the company fires him, possibly understandably, um, but then the company goes bankrupt, and the bankruptcy estate sues Mandel, the now former CEO. Yeah? Yeah. So there are a couple of mediations along the way, of course, because this is a mediation case. Um, and after the first mediation, Mandel, the former CEO, fires his lawyer uh, and says, actually, you know, uh, you haven't been uh, representing me properly and uh, I'm going to make a, a, take a malpractice action against you. All right? So asserts a malpractice claim but doesn't yet initiate it. Okay. So then there's another mediation along the way, uh, and, uh, and there's ultimately a settlement. And a term of this mediated settlement agreement is that Mandel, the former CEO, goes after his former lawyer um, for the malpractice suit and uh, splits any damages awarded in his favour. So then, complying with the mediated settlement agreement, the former CEO, Mandel, does this um, and in, uh, you know, in, in the process of bringing this action, uh, also seeks to bring evidence 
from the first mediation, right? So he's asking basically for an exception to the rules on confidentiality and non-admissibility of mediation evidence. Got you. And the question is, can he... Well, pass? exactly. You are on the pulse today, Alan. So uh, tell me, what did the court say? Well, the court identified a three-factor test, which is actually good because people can usually not remember more than three things. So, you know, if they'd had a nine-factor test, that would have been less than useful. So, so uh, sticking with the lucky number three, um, they've said, if you want um, relief from the rules of confidentiality, in other words, if you want an exception to the confidentiality regime generally, you need to show three things. First, you need to show a special need for the confidential material. Okay. Second, you need to show a resulting or consequent unfairness, right, from uh, not being able to uh, uh, discover or bring this, uh, um, uh, bring this uh, evidence from the mediation. Mm -hmm. And third, you need to show that your need for this mediation evidence, as I'll call it, outweighs the interest in maintaining confidentiality in the mediation. So all three, one plus two plus three, all three have to be shown. Okay. Yeah, and in this case, the court said um, that Mandel, our former CEO, was not able uh, to show all three. In fact, uh, he wasn't able to show a single one. Um, so he wasn't able to, <laughs> to um, bring evidence from the mediation. And so very quickly, um, in fact, John Swanson uh, sums this up very nicely in his blog, and he explains that in relation to the first point, um, the uh, uh, Mandel uh, was seeking a blanket lift of the veil of confidentiality. He said, you know, we just need to see what happened at the mediation, yeah. right? So he didn't submit any um, specific request, right, or he didn't show a special need, right, he just wanted to look into it generally. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't, that first point wasn't substantiated. Um, in relation to the second, um, the court said, well, there's no unfairness from a lack of discovery here because you could have got this evidence through other means, okay. for example, through responses to interrogatories or depositions. So you haven't shown any uh, resulting unfairness here. And third, um, based on one and two, um, you definitely haven't shown that there is a need uh, for your evidence uh, that outweighs the interest in maintaining confidentiality. And the court also said there is a presumption that mediation confidentiality prevails, right? So you really have to show something extraordinary um, to, uh, to, uh, to encourage the court to or convince the court to, to lift this veil of confidentiality. You know, other, otherwise, if people thought the, the court was just going to breezily, easily set aside the confidentiality rules, well, parties might um, not want to use mediation or might just be not forthcoming um, in mediation. Okay, so these three criteria together sounds like justify an exception to mediation confidentiality. Is that right? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what it seems. And they seem to me, you know, uh, just sort of just uh, on, on, on my uh, reading of them to be fairly, you know, reasonable um, uh, uh, points. And, I, you know, and I think, uh, you know, if you can show these, uh, you know, these three elements, um, there, uh, you know, there's a, good, uh, there's a good case for lifting the veil of confidentiality. Um, but if you can't, um, then you need to, to keep confidentiality to protect the integrity of the process. And it does seem to me to be um, consistent with a lot of the exceptions in other countries, particularly other common law countries. Right, okay. I was trying to make some connections between evidence and we're, we're, you know, we're in the US um, and I can't not um, uh, bring Trump into our show, but I don't want us to uh, get into a sort of a political uh, conversation. Um, but oh. what, what, some, something that struck me, uh, and it, it actually related to or relates to a mediation I had very recently. Now, I don't know if you've been following the whole Trump inauguration and this sort of catastrophe, the trail of destruction that he's laid in his wake for the last, you know, few weeks. But um, it all started, by all accounts, with um, him disputing the um, number of people that attended his inauguration. 
Okay, so um, he claimed that it was the most well attended the uh, inauguration ever. Um, I, well, I found some interesting uh, studies. One particular that struck me was that by a crowd scientist, right? This guy a is a crowd, crowd scientist. That's his job, studying crowds. Uh, a chap called Keith Still, who conducted a scientific analysis of the crowd size at Donald Trump's inauguration. And he compared aerial photographs of, of Washington Monument during Obama's 2009 oath of office, which, you know, happens at noon, with photographs, aerial photographs, of the same uh, plot of land at the same time, uh, noon during Trump's inauguration. And, you know, they were different. You know, the only conclusion that you could draw was that there were far more people that attended Obama's inauguration than they were there at Trump's, by a factor of, of 10 at least. Uh, but he went on further to explain how Trump could be confused by by this um, because obviously Trump when he was addressing the uh, the uh, the people that attended his inauguration he had one perspective and it wasn't an aerial perspective so he could obviously see you know thousands of heads uh, as far as the eye could see uh, so from from his perspective as far as he was concerned it was well attended but obviously the data tells us something different okay mm -hmm. so there in that respect, there is a truth, but there are also perspectives. Now, uh, follow me on this one now. So there, there was a, um, a mediation I was, uh, I was mediating recently, and um, I, was, I, I was stuck. I found myself stuck and struck. I had a meta moment where one party was adamant, adamant about the facts of what, what had happened in this particular case. And the other party had a completely different recollection of events. I mean, they were poles apart. Not a, not a, not. There, there wasn't any grey area. And they were, you know, this is what happened, or this is what happened. And look, you know, I've experienced that a lot in mediation. But I was struck by, I wasn't quite sure what to do next. How to address each party's uh, just. <laughs> truth how to address you know and not not that i wanted to address their truth not that i was felt that we were there to figure out who was right and wrong you know and that's the but they, they just couldn't get past and i couldn't i didn't just didn't know what to do and i was thinking to myself what should i say next and then i was thinking to myself this is all happening in the mediation then i was thinking to myself i must find someone on this planet to do an interview with or a little course with yes. on tactics to address moments like this so that, that that's the connection really well meanwhile i'm thinking until you find that person on this planet which i know you will that sounds like a really great question of the week alan it does sound like a great question of the week. okay so let me formulate this question yes yes um uh, it, when you encounter, as a mediator, when you encounter two parties that are entrenched in a particular perspective, that they are willing to throw everything else out of the window just to be proved right, how, what do you, how do you intervene in, in, a, in a moment like that in a mediation? What, you, what could you say? What could you do? Not necessarily to you know, to move the parties on, but just to, I don't know, you know, short of saying, uh, you, you know, that's your perspective and that's your perspective, and short of giving them a, a little tutorial on the ladder of inference, or short of showing them photo aerial photographs of Donald Trump's inaugural, you know, short of doing all of that, you know, what could you say that would be thoughtful, that, that might help the parties reflect on, perhaps there is a different perspective, I don't know. That was so that. what can you offer parties when they are so um, in, in, entrenched or wrapped up in completely different realities? There we are. Beautifully, eloquently summarised. Thank you very much, Nadia. So if you're, if you're watching the show and you are inclined to suggest a tactic, a strategy, point us in the right direction or in any direction, uh, please put them in the comments box We'll be uh, eternally grateful to you. Well, I think that's it for this week, Nadia. 
our tenth our tenth show. Um, I'm looking forward to show number twenty, and hopefully we'll get this uh, improve our format, improve the quality of our uh, reporting, and um, we will bring you uh, show number eleven, which will be even. Uh, slicker, more informative, more illuminating and outrageous. Thank you, everyone. And it's uh, goodbye from me in London. And goodbye from me in Singapore. Until next week.